1972, a crack commando unit was sent to prison by a military court for a crime they didn't commit. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the A-Team. cult TV classic. Um, it's the backstory um, was that there was a, a crack commando unit um, called the the, the A Team, obviously, um, who were fighting together in the Vietnam War, and their role was to undertake secret and the highly dangerous missions. One of these missions was a raid on the central bank of Hanoi. Um, the raid was top secret and aimed to destabilise the Vietnam uh, economy. Uh, Viet Cong economy, obviously. Um, because of the secret nature of the um, operation, only the team plus their commanding officer were aware of its existence. Unfortunately, whilst the team were out undertaking the operation, the base on which the commander was, was based was shelled. And the commanding officer, as well as his, his office and his paperwork, were all destroyed in the shelling raid which had the effect, um, we were told through inference, that when the team arrived back, as there was no justification for their raid, they were uh, tried and imprisoned um, for uh, committing a, a crime um, under the military, military codes. Um, the team were held in a military stockade, which is like a, like a prison, and they escaped from that. The team originally um, took to ground on the uh, in Los Angeles underground. Uh, however, as the series progressed, they they travel about the United States and for, in some episodes further afield. Now, what they they do is they hide themselves out as soldiers of fortunes and they take the position, uh, take the side of the underdog. Now, in practice, what that generally materialises to is um, going to places in small town America, small villages where you have small business owners or individuals that are harassed by um, local local gangs or indeed in some, some episodes organised criminals that are, are much larger than the, uh, the kind of small town itself. And these are, are places where local law enforcement um, is either too ineffective or indeed too corrupt to be able to fight their side. Consequently, the A-Team come in um, as soldiers of fortune to, to assist them. They, uh, they are never involved in um, oppressive acts themselves. They always take the underdog, uh, the underdog side of things. 
Um, during the during the episodes, um, because they are still wanted military criminals, there are run-ins with the military police when they find out uh, where they are. That normally happens when the team are arrested by the ineffective or corrupt police officers or sheriffs, depending on where it is, um, and their fingerprints, of course, are sent to the, the central authorities, <coughs> at which point it's picked up that they are wanted criminals. So there's a lot of run-ins with these uh, these groups, uh, with the military police as well, which will something we'll come on to a bit later and make for interesting episodes. Over to you, Billy. Okay, now we have our protagonist roll call. So first off the bat we have Hannibal Smith. He's the leader of the A team. He's a chain smoker by trade. And he's not the sort of guy you want to upset, as he's as handy with a gun or any other firearm as he is with his bare hands in a fight. In addition to that, he's also a master of disguise, donning costumes and outfits from the opera maniac to an old man in a shop to an old lady, so there's no stretch to what he can make you think he is. You know, he could be your butler, your, your caddy, anything. There's nothing this guy can't pretend to be. He's that good. Because he, he's Hannibal Smith, he's one of a kind. I agree with that, I agree with that. Um, he was, uh, he took his nickname Hannibal um, after the famous general, not not Hannibal Lecter, just to, just to clarify, he's a great strategist, and often um, there's a best battle of wits between him and some of the military police that come after him, um, which leads to, to interesting situations. He's the leader of the team, um, the commander, and um, certainly a very unique character, as would have to be in any, any kind of commando unit. Certainly, I think you've summarised him. Quite, quite well there. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to cover Face, uh, Face Man, Templeton Peck, Face Man being his nickname. Um, he isn't isn't a master of disguise, that isn't why he's got the, the nickname Face Man. Um, he is, however, the team's procurer of services and goods. Um, he is fundamentally a con man um, who acts to assist the team. It is um, said throughout the series and often inferred by, by anecdote and reference that he is able to get anything anywhere. Uh, there was a reference to him uh, obtaining a, a Cadillac, I think it was, in the middle of the Vietnam jungle, uh, in one particular episode, mm. but that's what he's known for. He usually procures items through uh, women, he's a ladies man. Unfortunately that has a negative side as well um, because he has got himself and by extension the team, as they're, they're one team, obviously rescuing him when he gets into issues, um, into problems because he has fallen for the, uh, the so-called honey traps many a time. Um, I'd have to say, and I don't know if you'd agree with me here elite, um, Faceman I'd say is the least loyal member of the team. He's very, uh, very effective there have been a couple of opportunities, a couple of times when he's thought he had the opportunity to, to leave the team behind and to get on um, in his own life. He's a social climber, he likes to mm. Um, mm. join country clubs and that kind of thing. Mm. There have been some, some times when he's felt he's had opportunities to be able to leave the team behind mm. and he's taken them with, with open arms, he's very, uh, taken both hands, he's very... Um, very eager for that, and therefore I'd say he's the least least loyal member of the team. I don't know if you'd agree with that. Yeah, definitely the most loyal, the most unloyalist detached in the whole team. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Is there anything else you think I've got maybe with with Face Man? Well, there have been brief takes on each humanity, mm. which we haven't seen in most case scenarios. Like, right. and one when he he finds out that a man who died was his father in one episode, a lot longer down the line, and then another episode. Um, he actually hires the A-team to go looking for a childhood friend of his who went missing, who I believe has been held against her will, and um, she basically tells him in the end when he's this close to losing his temper that, you know, if I stayed with you, I couldn't have gone through with what I wanted to do to be a nun. It was a childhood sweetheart, wasn't it, actually? Yes, it was, yeah, yeah, it was, yeah, a childhood sweetheart, that's what it was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, certainly. So, there are some times, actually, that's true, when you do see a human side to him, um, you, you do, but... I'd say compared to the rest of the team, that's that's in the minority. Well, the other team is the Exactly, very minority. Yeah. 
Um, the next character we're going to review is Murdoch. Uh, now Murdoch um, is, is, his, is his real name. It's usually prefaced with Howling Mad. <laughs> uh, Howling Mad Murdoch. No, yeah, no moons in this picture. Yeah. No. Um, he was the team's pilot in Vietnam and his role on the team primarily is to fly um, any aircraft, fixed wing, helicopters or indeed any of the custom aircraft that the team make themselves uh, during the, the, the various uh, escape attempts from they have to escape from. Um, so he's very adept at being a pilot. Now, he's a very complex character. He wasn't tried with the rest of the team for the crime, uh, the Bank of Hanoi raid, the alleged crime of the Bank of Hanoi raid. Um, and we can only infer that that's because of his mental issues. Um, he lives, certainly for the first few series, he lives in the VA, which is the Veterans Administration Hospital, from which we can determine that he has mental health issues. Um, there are lots of signs throughout the seasons that he's actually, season series, whatever words you want to use, that he's actually a lot saner than he um, appears on the surface. Because he is the only member of, member of the team that isn't wanted, he often comes to the team's rescue when they need to escape from the clutches of the military police or from the clutches of organised criminals. He is often solo uh, the person that comes in to, to, um, to rescue them. Um, so, so there are signs that, that his, his mental health perhaps isn't as bad as, as it appears on the surface. And there are some bits that are still a little bit unexplained about why he, he is living in the in the VA hospital, um, owing to his extensive abilities. That was still something that was left unanswered. Well, that's what I felt. What would your opinion there? Well, yeah. I mean, it, w it was virtually left to our own imaginations whether he um, whether he was really a badly an unwell patient or whether he was a poorly non. So clearly, they never really clarified whether it was one or the other. Yeah. No. Certainly. It's it's, it's one, of the, one of the odd things, um, one thing as well to mention is that certainly in the first couple of series seasons, whatever word I want to use, um, he was sprung, broken out from the VA hospital mm. in, in almost every episode for the first couple of series, mm. oh, it certainly seemed that way uh, and it does make you wonder a little bit about the reality of that, whether someone was cotton on that he's, you know, he's, having, he's escaping a lot more than any other patient and why he's not put into a, a very high security mm. um, mental health facility. So there's a couple of bits answered about that unfortunately and mm. that's not very satisfactory. Mm. But uh, as a character, character himself is very, probably the most loyal of the team. And I say that because when the team captured and he rescues them, he puts himself into harm's danger to do that, harm's way to do that, into danger. He doesn't need to. There's no compulsion. He can go off on his merry way and leave the team be, but he goes in to the bullet fire to save the team. Therefore, I'd say he's, he's the most loyal. Um, that's my opinion. De definitely. On to yourself. Yeah. Okay. So now, now we're on to B. A. Baracus. B. A. Baracus. He's a very big man. He's not the sort of guy you want to upset, mm -hmm. and his temper's just as surreal and dangerous as Hannibal's in a crew brawling fist fight in and out of any deadly situation. It's not just his temper that makes him who he is, he's also constantly at odds and ends, if you like, with um, Matt Murdock, um, who is frequently annoyed with him and the remainder of his team for um, drugging him to get him on planes, knocking him out, uh, hitting him when they're brave enough to do so, mm -hmm. which I would, have caught, I would have put across a suicidal attempt if I was the one who hit him. Yeah. I don't think I'd even be brave enough. He, he doesn't like flying. For all his strength and all his masculinity, he has a severe fear of mm -hmm. flying and therefore their me measures are necessary mm -hmm. to get him onto a plane. Mm -hmm. Yes, in addition to that, he also spends a lot of his time, as and when he can, when he's not on a mission with the rest of his team, the rest of his fellow 18 members in doing such jobs as uh, working with children in the community, um, playing ball games with them, and even helping them make models, um, just staying out of trouble, yeah, being a good role model to the children. Mm. 
and I think that's really what makes BA shine at the end of the day. Not just the jewellery around his neck, but being a totally brilliant guy. It's a kid. I agree with you there. There's, there's a, a very much a human side that you see to BA. For all his aggression, um, he does care a lot and is very protective mm. of um, the, 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 the children that are at the, the various community centres and so on where he, he helps at. Um, he does help them, obviously, with um, with certain things like uh, ball games and so on, keeping them off of the streets. Also, things like motor mechanics. He's a very, very good uh, mechanic, and he shares that experience as well. So, to okay. give give the children something to to work on to focus their energies. Mm. Um, and he has got uh, involved a couple of times through children, um, through the children to uh, issues that their parents are facing that are similar. Um, so I'd say he's, he probably shows the most human side, I'd say, actually, out of all the characters. Mm. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, lot going, a lot going for him, certainly. Mm -hmm. He's got a, a very large man, very strong man with a heart of a, heart, a very soft heart. Mm. Certainly. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that we've got the protagonists all said and done, I'm now going to cover the antagonist side. So first off, the antagonist roll call, we have um, the one and only Lynch. Colonel Lynch. Well, let's be quite blunt and honest. Lynch is not the brightest button in the military's gift box. And I'll tell you the reason why. Because he's had a multitude of enough opportunities to catch the A-team just to let his own um, guile and ineptitude. ineptitude literally bring him down and everything else crashing around his ears when he's fallen for gag after gag that the A-team have put under his, under his carpet. And then, you know, and eventually he ends up getting so... they immediate superiors end up getting so fed up with him like messing up you know, regime after regime and trying to, catch, yeah, yeah. to catch the A-team. Thank you. Um, he ends up being basically barred from trying to catch them all together and then another guy is put into the resume uh, Decker's the next guy who tries to get the A-team and he's probably one of the most dangerous foes I've ever had to face. He's a lot more clever than Lynch. Mm. He doesn't fall in any way for the same um, like silly tricks that any of the others do. And he's a lot more intelligent than what they give him credit for. And he's even, in one episode, he was so determined to get the A-team he didn't even bother with a warrant to search the premises. So that gives you an idea of how desperate and relentless this man is to apprehend the A team at any cost. Mm. And um, it's not just that that brings him to odds and ends in frustration with Hannibal, but it's other things as well, like when they pull a joke on him and he ends up shooting up his own place. Now, if that's not a recipe to dis for disaster, for him wanting to get the A team more than anything, I don't know what is. Mm. I'd say, he's, I'd say um, Colonel Decker is, is the most interesting um, antagonist. Mm. Um, there's a bit of a, a backstory that we learn um, in the A team uh, between um, him and Hannibal Smith. Um, they were both uh, in Vietnam. Mm. They were both colonels in Vietnam. I believe he was still a colonel in Vietnam. Yeah. Both colonels in Vietnam. And there was a, a, a kind of an inferred punch up between him and uh, him and Decker, uh, Smith and Decker, uh, at the officers' mess hall. Um, and there's been there's been some friction between. They're both great strategists, so there's a lot of strategy on both sides between tit and tat. Mm. Um, Smith always comes up the um, you know the best, and there are some very interesting scenes, such as the one referenced by Elite there, um, where the uh, the escaping AT after escaping from the clutches of Decker hides in his married quarters. They then remotely set the Sound of War record to play and basically cause Colonel Decker and his men to, to shoot up his own <laughs> property. Um, it's certainly a very good episode and it's certainly one that, that, that you should watch. Um, you should watch the entire series, definitely, but there are some great moments like that. Mm. I'd say he was the best... Um, Antagonist, big, big um, adversary 
of the 18. Yeah, it was, to it was totally the nemesis they've been waiting for. Yeah, certainly, certainly the best one. Not the only one, there's more to come, but no. I'd say he was the best one for, for pure entertainment. Mm. Sorry. That's right. Well, okay, the final antagonist at our disposal is um, Fulbright. Mm. Um, basically, he was a general, he was a general Fulbright was a guy who tried to get his hands on the A-team as much as any of the others and failed at a multitude of times and in one episode Hannibal even had the gall to actually come up to him just before the episode was going to finish at his birthday or something that was thrown in his honour but inevitably that all comes falling apart around Fort Bright's ears when um, he enlists the aid of the A-team the men, very men he's been trying to catch to help him find his daughter Mm. who's been taken by terrorists. Eventually after that, um, sometime before he's tragically killed by enemy gunfire from the terrorists, he ends up finding out that Murdoch is actually a secret member of the A-Team, but tragically ends up taking this secret to the grave when he's, as I said, tragically killed by enemy gunfire. Mm. He, he certainly... There was an interesting human side to Fall right? but I'd say overall death would have to be the... The, 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 the key kind of adversary. They're the the, the three um, main generals, the uh, sorry, main uh, military um, antagonists. Um, there was a, a, a further one, I believe, that stood in for one or two episodes that wasn't very good. I'm not sure if you remember the mm, name. Yeah, no, I don't remember the name, but I remember he was a particular temporal substitute for Decker. Yeah, it wasn't as good though, <laughs> from what I, from what I remember. And obviously, of course, in every episode there are the, the criminals and so forth, which are obviously adversaries. I'm not going to go through every every one, but the main ones, the kind of recurring adversaries, are the military police, where they have the, the cat and mouse fights between the team and the military police to evade capture and, and escape capture when they um, when they are temporarily uh, caught. Mm -hmm. So they're the uh, the main characters, the main adversaries and uh, now we need to go on to um, general um, observations about the uh, about the series things that are to its benefit and to its uh, sort of disadvantage do you want to start off with some, with some good points mm -hmm. on it yeah well thank you well obviously um this was a program made in the 80s and um it was terrific when you compare it to today's standards, because in today's standards they seem to fall back way too much from CGI and every mm -hmm. other effect. Well, back then, all the effects were pretty much done smack bang in real time. Every bullet was fired properly, and every explosion was totally 100% real. Yes, I, I'd agree with that. What looks very good is, is, is whilst we're not saying there are no special effects, um, obviously live bullets were used near the actors mm. and um, you know, vehicles may explode when, when they would crash and they wouldn't in real life. But the fact of the matter is that every explosion that you see was created by explosives, not a spotty teenager with a computer fiddling around, making it look like it was. Everything was real. Everything exploded with explosives. And that kind of gritty realism mm. is something that I... I quite like with the A-Team. Yeah, it's the, it's the kind of camaraderie and admiration that you, you admire all the more because it's something that can't be faked. Yeah. One one other thing on that subject that I'm not quite sure, I, I'm still not quite sure whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, very few people die in the A-Team compared to the amount of gunfire that there is. Um, there are, we count on, on the numbers of, uh, you know, things of one hand rather, the amount of people that have died um, during the entire run of the A-Team. And I think there are only one or two that died in battle or as part of an aggressive act as opposed to died of natural causes um, or anything like that. Um, it's a frequent, um, it's a frequent uh, kind of recurring thing that, that comes across that uh, if a car is to, to spin over, is a car to explode or something and, and, and would spin over, the wheels to explode, the car spin over, that you would hear the voices of the actors um, 
it's a hint, you know. Are you alright, Bob? Are you alright, Joe, or whatever name? So that the viewer would know that no one has died in that. Um, sometimes that, that, you know, from a realism point of view, leads you to go a little bit, mm, yeah, okay. Hi all, sorry for the uh, little impromptu, impromptu break there. Um, it's like a technical issue. Now, as I was saying, um, the relative lack of deaths in the A-Team um, was something that, that, that does um, make you go a little bit, mm, uh, but um, I think, the more I think about it, if you have to look at it from the context um, of the original series and its audience who it was aimed at, and it was fundamentally aimed at uh, teenagers, young adults, and I think that it had to be somewhat sanitised for that, um, and that audience wouldn't perhaps have appreciated the, the reality of war and the reality of, of automatic gunfire, which is mutilated bodies and, and deaths um, on a mass scale. So I think, all in all, that, um, that can be kind of explained justified so I don't see that as a, as, a, as a full negative, to be honest with you. However, there are some issues which do really great. So for the negatives, so the, over to you, Lee. Thank you, Mr. Poe. Mm. Right, well, the first nitpick we have on our nitpick roll call mm. is on um, the 18 van. I mean, the amount of times that's been known to heal itself, or sorry, re repair itself, but it's seemingly by magic. I mean, you know, how does it do that? I mean, has, has the Wolverine had anything to do with this or what? Oh, I agree. Um, so we were discussing just while we were resolving technical issues. Mm. The 18 van, picture below, is the team's main conveyance. Um, it's, as you can see, quite distinctive, uh, distinctive red detail on the side. You do kind of think that if you're a, you know, if you are wanted criminals, which say, well, they were convicted, that you'd perhaps drive around in something with a little, little less you know, kind of obviousness, perhaps a little bit more discreet, but nonetheless that's something else. Um, one of the main issues with the series is continuity, and a big part of that is the 18 van, and its apparent ability to sustain um, extensive damage in one scene, and then a few moments later, um, then that's magically healed, and, and that, that really annoys me, because there are certain there are certain things, fair enough, you know, it's made up and you can you can forgive it. But that particular thing, there's no reason why they couldn't have written into the script uh, a repair or even a temporary bodge job. Um, we know that BA is very mechanically minded. He could have done a temporary solution. It could have been duct taped up, whatever. But don't just just make the vehicle heal itself. It's it's just it's just illogical, and and that is something that's a big issue for me in the series continuity. Mm. Uh, um, if, if I may be permitted to, to just say one other thing from, from my point of view, gripes. Mm. There were some additional characters um, throughout the series. Um, two of these were, were ladies that um, were newspaper reporters. Uh, there was one in, in one series and then one in another. They may have actually transgressed series, that's, that's not too important. The point is, though, that they never become full members of the team. Um, they kind of become ancillary members of the team that were always there, but didn't help out the team in, in, in many ways. It was a bit, why are they there? I, I suppose it has to be looked at in the context of the 1980s. Um, things weren't quite as equal as they are now. Consequently, um, you know, women getting involved in fighting and gun handling and so on, perhaps wouldn't have been that well received. So perhaps that's why they didn't take an active part. But unfortunately, they were kind of thrust into being active, um, they're being having a lot of screen time and, and kind of acting like um, full members, apart from when the fighting started. A couple of exceptions to that, but. Nonetheless, you do kind of think they're the token female character there. I don't think they did 
anyone any good, um, to, to be honest with you. So that's, that's one, one criticism there again might be the sort of sign of the, of the times that the, the thing was filmed. Anything else that's... Uh, yeah, and on top of that, um, behind the scenes, um, Hannibal didn't get on very well with the female cast. Mm. The actor that played Hannibal, which is uh, yeah, um, George Peppard? Yes, uh, George Peppard didn't get on very well with uh, the lady who played Amy Allen, and, uh, and obviously the other female cast down the line. And in addition to that, he also didn't get on very well with the man who portrayed B.A., Mr. T. So there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of the friction between these people beyond the scenes. Mm. Yeah, this came out sometime after, afterwards, but there was a lot of friction between the BA and um, BA Bracus, uh, Mr. T, who played BA Bracus, Indeed. and um, George Peppard, who played Hannibal Smith, about who was getting the most, who was sort of the star of the show, who was getting the most attention, the most mm. screen time. Size of Weapons was mentioned as well, we all know what that means. Yeah. Um, there were a few things, a few things to do with that. One other thing that I'd like to, to just throw in there. Um, it's very convenient that whenever the team are captured, they are left alone, which gives them time to plot their escape. There's often perhaps a guard at the door or similar, but not in with them. The team are usually kept together. Again, allows them to, to plot together. And unfortunately, as I mentioned before, a lot of the team's escapades are in small town America. Therefore, this isn't completely um, unlikely, you know, but nonetheless, they do always seem to be trapped in places where there are plenty of tools. There's always, there's always a welding equipment mm. um, and other, you know, uh, kind of raw materials and similar mm. that the team are able to use to their yeah. advantage. Yeah, I agree. There's, de there's definitely times like this where it seems to work against the tension. Uh, in every episode it's trying to convey where um, they, wherever they're sharp in jail or wherever they seem to be in a place however a shut off from the rest of humanity where they've all got all these devices mm, it happens to be a massive drill around yeah, and a welding yeah, all these, all, these de all these devices and objects which literally catapult them into a win-win situation just like that certainly I mean it's very creative this is the key tenant of the of the program, very creative in what they create with the tools available. Yeah. It's just a concept of whether the just the issue of whether the tools would really be that available mm. in a real life situation, and whether anyone, especially the military police who are aware of how slippery the characters are, would leave them alone altogether to plot. Surely they'd separate them, or they'd have guards in with them, mm. but they don't. And that's one particular thing that's a little bit questionable. Questionable. Um, I don't have any other points you want to mention before we come to a kind of summing up. Well, not so much, but I just wanted to say overall, we really enjoyed putting this review together. Definitely. Um, the A Team was probably one of the greatest highlights of my childhood, well before I was a fully grown man. And with any luck, I guess the same goes to my guest reviewer. Yeah, it was a program I grew up, uh, grew up with. Uh, Repeats, but nonetheless, properly. So, I'd say, in summary, um, in some ways, a difficult program, really, because I like it owing to its realism, in that there's no CGI, an explosion is an explosion, I, and I like the gritty nature of it. Fights as well. Again, there are there are fights, and of course they're, they're acted, they're staged, but they're they're quite realistic in a lot of a lot of ways. There's no mm. character with any kind of superhuman strength. Obviously, BA is very strong, but he's rather larger and muscly. You expect that. There are no um, kind of uh, semi-sci-fi um, superhuman strengths or anything like that. So I really like the kind of realism on on that thing. And that that there's a lot of that um, that in there that that I like and it. It makes it a very good program, in my opinion. Meets in the words there slightly, but you get the point. <laughs> the, the problem is that, that the area that counters it is also realism. And the biggest thing for me, I can forgive the lack of deaths, bearing in mind the audience is fair enough, and that, that's you know possible. 
Unfortunately though, the self-repairing 18 band and other continuity issues I just can't ignore. So I like it a lot because of the realism. I dislike it somewhat because of the lack of realism on the other hand. I just wish they'd have got that right. All in all, then from, from my point of view, my personal review, okay, gonna have to be a seven out of ten. Still very high because of the um, of the lots of elements that are real in it. It's also very good, I'd say, because of the poignant messages. There were some episodes that have a, a strong moral thread yeah. to the to mm. the story, mm. and there's the working together elements and so on that, that I like the camaraderie. Yeah. So I'd say for me, overall, seven out of ten. If they had got the continuity issues correct, it would by all means be a ten out of ten. But unfortunately, that has to knock off thirty percent of the score. As for me, well, as I said. This was literally the highlight of my youth and my childhood, and um, you know, to see Mr. T as BA was literally uh, a part he was destined to play since the beginning of his life, mm. and I don't think they could have chosen a better man to play that than everyone else. So I'm gonna give the A team and one above seven out of ten, I'm gonna give it an eight out of ten because although it did it, it wasn't without its inconsistencies in one proverb or another. It had enough going for it in the morals and everything else it set forth, where I can slightly, not totally ignore these inconsistencies, but just slightly overlook them because whatever you think of this premise, it's a lot better than that god horrible damn abomination which was the 2010 18. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's not let's not get into that. That's one of the reasons um, why we made this review, because unfortunately, the only thing that appeared to be on YouTube was the reviews of the uh, well, reviews of the 2010 film, which unfortunately, all the things that made the 18 good, in my opinion, the gritty realism, the lack of CGI, and what made it work to this very what, day. Exactly what made it work. What happened? It was just transformed into any old Hollywood any old Hollywood thing with guns and explosions happening everywhere mm. that were all fake mm. and that, that bothers me, that bothers me the, the kind of reputation of the programme and of the actors unfortunately George Peppard passed away in uh, 1994 and relatively recently last year in 2012 Lance Lee Gortz who played Colonel Decker also passed away um, I'm sure there are other, other actors that, that, that have, and uh, obviously the, the others of that have aged and whatever somewhat, but um, it's rather sad that their work, um, their, their memories that have been associated with the A-Team have been linked with the 2010 film, which is, is just an abomination in, in my opinion. So I do urge you to watch A-Team episodes, there are some available on YouTube, um, there are going to be some good clips. We're going to look for some good clips and place the links in the uh, in the section below. And uh, I hope you enjoy viewing. Hope you enjoy viewing them as much as uh, mm -hmm. as much as we did when we were when we were growing up and, and still do now. Exactly. And if you have any trouble finding them on YouTube, and there's plenty of decent DVD stores in and around town, so you can look into this brilliant series from the 1980s. Yeah. The one and only. The A team. <laughs> Thank you very much once more for inviting me today. Uh, today, Ali, it's been a, it's been a pleasure. Anytime, mate. Thank you. So that was that. This will be our final words on the A team. Thanks for watching, guys. Goodbye. Thank you. Right, good. Let me just cut the last bit. Not the last, yeah.